Spider-Man does whatever a spider can. Spins a web any size, catches seeds just like guys. Look out, here comes the Spider-Man. Welcome to Wherezilla's Retrospective. I'm your host, Wherezilla. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure Spider-Man is one of those characters that was specifically made to suffer. One of Marvel Comics' most successful characters, Spider-Man was made as someone the readers could relate to, considering most superheroes, at the time of his creation, were largely idealized, while the webhead had more real-life issues. Spidey has had many incarnations, from the comics, to the movies, to three different cartoons. Which brings us to today's topic, the cartoon from the schizophrenic 90s. What do I mean by that? Well, this was made during the same time the Batman animated series came out, and of course, this meant more superhero shows needed to come out. But this was also the time when cartoons started to undergo heavy censorship. But before we get into censorship or even the plot, we have to talk about the theme song. Not that it's the worst theme I've ever heard, but what am I supposed to say to that? It doesn't really set a tone, it just makes you never want to hear these words ever again. So the first season is mostly setting up the status quo. Spidey's secret identity as Peter Parker, he works at the Daily Bugle, and we got Eddie Brock, the man the universe seems to hate, since the webhead keeps ruining his life, both intentionally and unintentionally. Then there's Peter's boss, Jameson, one of the funniest characters in the show. And while he will stop at nothing to see Spider-Man ruined, he isn't completely one note, as I'll discuss later. What I can't ignore, however, is his voice actor. Because Spider-Man's a glory hog who never thinks of the consequences of what he's doing. Always rushing into action without thinking of the consequences. What? You're expecting thanks? You can probably guess what I wasn't expecting. Of course, we have Peter's Aunt May, who may be a little senile, but at least she's a kind lady. Again, I'll get into that later. You got Dr. Connors, who throughout the show's run will have to deal with his problem of turning into the lizard on occasion. We have side characters Deborah and Flash, and then there's Mary Jane Watson and Felicia Hardy. Wait a minute. Mary Jane Watson, Felicia Hardy... Someone's missing. And of course you have the villains, ranging from Scorpion, to Dr. Octopus, to Mysterio. Although the one who can really take the position of big bad for the show would be Wilson Fisk, the kingpin of crime, and mastermind behind most story arcs in the show. And of course it was this show that introduced, or rather retooled, the alien costume storyline into the more streamlined arc everyone prefers. Peter gets his hands on the alien symbiote that turns his costume black and amplifies his rage, and no other personality changes. And I have to say, the wisecrack Spidey has made so far is replaced with enough fury to almost try to decapitate Rhino with a door. And as for his plans for Shocker, <laughs> well... Shocker! You to the ends of the earth! Did I forget to mention that little tidbit about the voice acting? They could go really over the top. Doc Ock being a consistent offender, next to Spider-Man here of course. Needless to say, Spidey gets rid of the symbiote, but the alien costume was a three-parter, not two, and this led to Brock getting the symbiote. Why don't we introduce you to our better half? We call ourselves... I'll give the show credit, Eddie Brock and his hatred for Spider-Man was established long before this point, and Venom was far from shoehorned in this time around. And shortly after this we got the two-parter Hobgoblin, which introduced... the Hobgoblin. Kind of odd, since in the comics he's supposed to be an upgrade to the Green Goblin's powers, not the other way around. I mean, we do have Norman Osborn, but he no powers just yet. Still, the Hobgoblin is pretty interesting. First, he works for Osborn to assassinate Fisk. Then he double-crosses him to Fisk. 
Then he triple crosses Fisk, wrecking his base of operations. And then he quadruple crosses Osborne, using his son Harry as a hostage. Damn. There is, um, one little distraction about him, though. <laughs> Yeah, the fact that the characters occasionally refer to the Hobgoblin as a clown has to be on purpose. Also, for some reason, this isn't the season 1 finale. Instead, a one-off episode involving the chameleon is. Still, the episode in question did take the opportunity to introduce Supreme Headquarters International Espionage Law Enforcement Division. But enough about them, it's time for season 2, which was one long arc involving Spidey's powers in flux. First, he started to lose them, Right around that time, Fisk formed the Insidious Six, of course. And then he started to mutate into a spider monster. Also during this time, new character and love interest for Felicia, Michael Morbius, gets his hands on a sample of Spider-Man's blood. He radiates it further, and it turns him into a bloodthirsty vampire. He didn't get a full plasma drain, but I still feel weak. Oh wait, I'm sorry, plasma. Because we can't say blood in a cartoon, can we? Except, you know, in the opening theme, and the few occasions where you actually do say blood. You are made of stupid. Oh, and by the way, S.H.I.E.L.D.'s appearance last season was only the beginning. This one, crossovers started happening a lot more often. Blade and the Punisher show up in a few episodes, and boy are they backdoor pilots if I've ever seen them. Their respective episodes take long periods of time to introduce both characters and their backstories. The only one that doesn't really feel like it was made to start another show would be the X-Men crossover. And that's only because they already had a 90s cartoon by this point. Though calling it a crossover may be a bit of a stretch, since the only ones who really got a decent amount of screen time would be Beast and, of course, Wolverine. Don't feel too proud of that fact, bub. We'll be talking about what you've done to the X-Men series next time. So by the end of the second season, Morbius's chances of turning human again are gone, Felicia is heartbroken, Dr. Connors manages to get rid of Spider-Man's mutation by transferring him to the Vulture. There's also a side story about Mary Jane involving Hydro-Man, who uh, turns out to be an obsessed waterbending stalker, which will be more important later on. I just wish it wasn't. Season 3 brought even more crossovers. First Doctor Strange, and later Daredevil. Now, admittedly, with Daredevil, it did advance Spidey's story, actually revealing to Spider-Man that Fisk was the kingpin, something he had not learned up to that point. Mind you, it's still a backdoor pilot, and the creators admitted to that. For this one, anyway. And here is where Peter and Mary Jane start to get closer. Felicia meets a guy by the name of Jason, but Hobgoblin puts a stop to that. No, not by killing him. Nobody kills anyone unless it's a backstory in this show but rather by being the Hobgoblin. I'm like a black cat, bringing bad luck into everyone's path, including my own. I don't really sound like that, do I? <laughs> Speaking of curses, let's talk about two characters' introductions that really start to drag things down. First is Madame Webb, a mystic who's preparing Spider-Man for a great challenge, interrupting him all the time and being unnecessarily cryptic. She really feels out of place, since up to this point, the show has embraced more science-based ideas. To the point that Techno Battle would get grading, but at least it fits with Spidey being a SCIENCE MAJOR! Webb's magic, on the other hand, feels like it should belong somewhere else. And then of course there's... If I were Peter Parker, wild horses couldn't keep me away. I swear, sometimes I think they would be better off if they caught Peter and locked him up. <sighs> Mary Jane's Aunt Anna. Anna fucking Watson. Easily the most annoying character in the show. Every single scene she's in is, Peter Parker is the worst thing ever, repeated ad nauseum. At least with Jameson, we saw very early on why he didn't trust Spider-Man or anyone wearing a mask. He is a widower because of a guy in a mask, after all. But Anna Watson? She will never ever say anything good about Peter, insulting him in front of Mary Jane, and even Aunt May, who is supposed to be her best friend. There's even one point where Mary Jane goes missing, she blames Peter, and basically sicks the Punisher on the guy with no evidence whatsoever. 
How is it that Jameson can create a supervillain specifically designed to bring Spider-Man down, run several smear campaigns against the webhead, put a bounty on his head, twice, and still be a more likable character? <laughs>